were the plays out of this world. Leigrid Stevens' Spaceman has taken coping with grief to a whole new level. Molly is all alone on a mission to Mars with just Houston and computer buddy Jim and Sip the Plant for company. While she is battling not enough ventilation, smelly suits, meteor and radiation showers, she is also trying to come to terms with the death of her astronaut husband who became untethered during a spacewalk, her religious mother, and poor ratings from her space broadcast. Will she find her husband Harry or God first? Will Texans finally win the Super Bowl? Will she make it to Mars? This was an astounding production. Everything about this made you feel like you were actually in this space capsule on your way to Mars. You you were not in a theater at, on Wild Project at all. And Aaron Treadway, oh my gosh, the litany of human emotions and expressions that came across her face of fear, joy, sorrow, anger. It was just so compelling to watch. This was so, so good. As part of the Frigid Festival, which is going on to March 10th, I saw the gay card, and this is going to be a review for adults only. Uh, it's written by Logan Martin Arcand and directed by Ed Mendez, and it's from a group of um, theater people from Saskatoon, and they came all the way to New York for the Frigid Festival. This deals with two young 20-something gay men, Cold Pizza Slice and Fuckboy, who've been <laughs> fuck buddies in the past, and now they reconnect. And the thing is, um, both of them would actually like to be involved in a serious relationship, but are kind of afraid to make the step to let somebody else know that. And you're wondering, will they be able to get beyond that and really be together? The two performers, uh, Torian Calferrata and, um, let's see, Mitchell Kent Larson, are both very appealing young actors. And... They play the characters really well, and you are rooting for them. But you have to see it yourself to find out. I'm giving it a happy face minus, because after all, dealing with emotional vulnerability is nothing new, but it's well done. Jan Ewing and I saw a random acts written and performed by Renata Henrik's longer review on the Facebook page. It's a dramatization of an intensely personal experience from the author's childhood. Her family, her Lutheran minister father, ended up on the south side of Chicago in the 60s. And this intelligent memoir explores the random act of a young Samaritan that sustains a child's faith in equality through the early years of the civil rights movement. And it's so well done. Her ex She's a dancer, so her body's expressive as well as her doing all the parts of mother, father, sundry street characters, young, old, black, white. It's just remarkable, and it just shows you a different side of racism. And I, me and Jan just love this. At Metropolitan Playhouse, you could see State of the Union, written by Howard Lindsay and Russell Krauss, directed by Laura Livingston. And it deals with the 1948 presidential election and the possibility of a dark horse candidate who's an honest airplane manufacturer named Grant Matthews possibly becoming the Republican candidate for that election. Um, and the trouble is, will he be too honest? Will he give away too much of his opinions and therefore alienate potential um, big wig and big money um, sponsors of the Republican Party. His wife's trying to keep him honest, but his mistress is trying to keep him in line. Oh my God. You know, it's that whole idealist versus the political machinery that you love and born yesterday and Mr. Smith goes to Washington. And, you know, while politicians may be slick, this production was slicker and the cast were smooth talkers. And I... It's incredibly well written and beautifully done because the costumes are just eye-popping. And unfortunately, you know, ideas don't work anymore. In fact, there was a line in the play that just made that just made me burst into tears all over again, where he says the president is supposed to protect the people. And we know that's Good not Good luck. That's not going on right now. It was a pleasure to see how important women women were in the scheme of things. Mm -hmm. They they all had very important jobs. And I just thought this was just... Yeah, they were much better at manipulating this guy than any of the men were. 
and, and the whole cast and everything about this was just so remarkable. I, and, and Metropolitan Playhouse is always good. This is up to their super high standards yeah, of excellence. I know. They always find the most amazing plays to do that are so relevant that were written so long ago. Don't you agree? Yeah. And, it, and again, it's such a pleasure to hear really good writing. Go. Lisa Ramach and I took a trip to Paper Mill Playhouse in Milburn, New Jersey to see my very own British Invasion. Rick Elise heard a story from Peter Noon of the Herman Hermits about what it was like back in the days before when the British Invasion was just about to hit America and all these famous rock and rollers were teenagers at the Bag of Nails and you have a love triangle between Peter, Johnny Ames, and Pamela, bad girl, Erica Olsen, who hopes to be a folk singer, and even badder boy, Connor Ryan. And who's she going to choose, the sweet innocent or the hard rocker? And Connor Ryan, I mean, he gets a thousand percent. He is just like, ooh, it's like, but then Johnny Ames is so adorable. And you have all those wonderful songs from the Herman Hermits and the zombies. And they have, of course, Ed Sullivan and the Beatles make an appearance. And you, oh, you're going to love all the songs. Everyone's bopping in their seats. And can't you hear my heartbeat? It's so funny the way they use it. You will die laughing. So anyway, me, well, Lisa didn't like it as much as I did. I gave it a happy face minus, and she gave it a mix. And throughout the show, I'm going to have little scenes, little, you know, musical selections throughout the show about it. But really, take a trip to Paper Mill Plays, especially if you're of that age and remember the music. It's your childhood. You will love it. And the entire press conference, I talked to Peter Noon and a lot of the cast members. It's all on YouTube, Eva Heinemann. Go there and watch Watch it. Jake Goldbus has a longer review on Facebook of Eat the Devil by playwrights Nadja Lanhart and Dan Nuxall, and it's at the Tank on West 36th Street in Manhattan. The play is at its funniest when the explosions go off and the plane is crashing. It's a sci-fi comedy, think Goldbusters. Ghostbusters, that like most contemporary theater, has thought about the cultural moment and can go deeper than any mainstream movie. The play's prophecy has a resolution that the members of this dystopia really do work things out and life goes on, sort of. In between explosions and jokes, the play's heart is an extremely subtle point. When millennials, men and women, retreat into the shadows for robots, VR and porn, and Amazon, it's not just some grand moral story about gender relations. The letdown is the loss of friendship told in sad laughter and happy tears, and he gave it a happy face. This is Leslie D'Elia's review of Robert Bolt's A Man for All Seasons, done by Fellowship of the Performing Arts, it's a per perfect blend of first-rate elements, script acting and directing are flawless, and the scenic design and costumes enhance the action and characters rather than distracting. It's the story of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn and Thomas More, who was the Chancellor of, of England at that point, and Henry VIII wanted to marry Anne Boleyn, so he broke with the church and became the, the Supreme Church of England, and he had this oath of supremacy that Thomas More refused to sign, and what that caused to happen to him. So she says, Michael Countryman portrays Thomas More with sharp and elegant dignity, visibly aging as he holds fast to his conscience against King Country and his family. Todd Servers is mesmerizing as Thomas Cromwell, Moore's rival and brilliant but low-born right hand to the king. Servers is especially adept with Cromwell's fits of violence. And Trent Dawson captured King Henry VIII's charisma, charm, mercurial nature to perfection. A Man for All Eight Seasons is simply spectacular. One of the best written plays of all times, it tells the story of one man who followed his conscience and raises many questions about right, wrong, and ambiguity that are as relevant today as they were 600 years ago. And as Mark said... Right, it's sort of a story about an executive order that nobody likes and causes a lot of trouble. And she gives us a happy face. And a little sneak preview of next week where we'll have... True West, which is Sam Shepard's masterpiece about two brothers in their mom's house trying to work on a screenplay and working on each other's nerves, and some other things that Eva will tell you about. 
and we're going to talk about the light on our next show. Jan Ewing and I saw this at the new MCC. It's by Logan Vaughn. It's this wonderful two-character play about this couple. And if they knew the facts about things, things might have turned out differently. It's an extremely emotional play. Really raises interesting questions. And you're really left pondering afterwards. We were talking for three blocks afterwards about this play. So you know it's going to get a happy face. You know the reviews on the Facebook page, but more on our next show, which will be March 16th. And also, um, these will be closed by the time we can talk about them. But we're, oh, no, it's not. So we'll be also talking about Hurricane Diane at New York Theater Workshop. And um, Lolita, which I'm going to be talking about later. On March 2nd, in Philly, Boston, or Baltimore is going on. That's a talk with Peter Felicia and uh, Josh Ellis. And Edward Einhorn's The Neurology of the Soul is going on right now. You can find out about it on the Facebook page. The review will be there. And he always says wonderful things. So, um, again, lots going on. And interspersed between all the reviews will be musical selections from Brits Off-Broadway to give you a taste of what you should go see. Cherie's review of Bonnie's Last Flight. It's a silly comedy about a dog named Bonnie who was taking a flight from New York to Chicago. The whole theater is transformed as, it's, as if it's inside of a plane with first class and coach seating arrangements. Jan, Barbara Walsh, is a senior flight attendant taking her last flight with her dog, Bonnie. She wants to retire and be a writer. The staff gets into their memories of their flying experiences, regrets, and joys of being alive. It's a good effort. Set design by Meredith Reese is realistic. Sound design by John Gasper is effective. And the acting by the crew is okay as well. But unfortunately, this was not Bina's cup of tea. It sounds like it would have been mine, but I couldn't fit it in. But it... Anyway, go see why she, it wasn't her cup of tea on the Facebook page where her review is much longer. And now for William J. Cataldi's review of Bleach, Written by Dan Ireland Reeves and directed by Zach Carey. Taking place in Tyler's actual apartment in Bushwick, where the bed is important in Tyler's world, fathers leave and everything can be reduced to crass capitalistic encounter. He tried waiting tables, but the rewards of the sex trade far exceeded slinging Chinese food for a living. If you know why this play is called Bleach, it may be for you. It didn't give me any it didn't give me any hope for those born in the 90s, but it made me think feel interesting things. This debut of Bleach is a well-acted, well-crafted artwork worthy of attention. Can one be a promiscuous druggy gay man living in New York City and have a soul? Yes, but this play won't show you how. He gives it a happy face and again more on Facebook. Jan Ewing recently saw The Great Cat Massacre. Well, I saw this a long time ago at the Fringe. Now it's part of the Popsicle Festival. And it's book music lyrics by Greg Moss and Casey O'Neill. And, oh my gosh, this is actually a real incident that happened in French history, believe it. Wikipedia it. Anyway, so these two apprentices are really pissed off because their master leads all the money, his rich he's rich, to his stupid wife's cat, Bon Bon. So they, they say that kitties are demons. It's like the crucible. So everyone goes around massacring cats. <laughs> the book is over the top, deliberately and delightfully absurd. It's clever and funny from the beginning to the end, whether you know what's going on or not. I liked it a bit more than, than Jan did, but read our review on the Facebook page. But it's I just came from the last musicals in Mufti, Lolita My Love, Opening Nights, 
of the Allen G. Learner Series, and I talked to Caitlin Cohn, Robert Sella, Eric Hagenson, Georgia Booth, Thursday Farrar, Denise Cordell. Caitlin Cohn. It's Lolita, my love. Is that it's Lolita, my love, right? That's correct, it is, yes. You play Lolita. I'm talking. Quite, it's quite a role to take on, but such a privilege, and it's tough in the best way. And as a young actress, I mean, I can't think of a better learning experience. It's such a gift. But how? It's interesting. I mean, everyone really has different opinions about this character. For so long, she's been so stereotyped and stigmatized. But when I read the script, I saw this brilliant, strong young woman who was doing everything that she felt she needed to do in her situation in order to survive and get the future that she wants and deserves. And at that time, you know, you needed a man in order to do that in some respects. And then she got herself into very dark territory and was able to realize it and work herself out of it with dignity and power. And so, I mean, I really, I empathize with her very much, but I empathize with every character in this play. To me, there's no real villains in this play, even despite what people think. It's like everyone has aspects of villainy in them. Exactly, exactly. But like people, we're not all villains all the time, and we're not all perfect all the time. So there's there's all sides. Yeah, you bring mother-daughter issues to a whole new level. Yeah, yes, definitely, absolutely, that's true, yeah. Robert Sella. And you got the tricky part of Humboldt Humboldt. I did, I did. Humbert Humbert and La Lolita, my love. It's been a real challenge for sure. Well, I mean, I think what's hard about this is that the book is so famous and so beloved, even though it obviously deals with such a difficult subject. And this musical is attempting to try to find a way to tell this story that people can at least be invited into trying to see what may be going on in the inner workings of these people. And so it's a real challenge to try to invite people to you know, just take a deep breath and go on the journey and let their curiosity and their open-mindedness find out what makes somebody so horrible, what, what makes these terrible events happen, and hopefully they can, you know, go along, you know, with us for the story. And uh, I think they did tonight. Uh, yeah, but especially because... I think he believes it's pure, and he really loves this young woman with all of his might, but I think to look at it from the outside, it's, you know, it's obviously... It isn't anything about it that's right. Everything about it is so wrong and has a sort of a toxic sort of terrifying element to it but you have to want to stay there for two hours and see what will happen so if he was just a sort of ogrey terrifying you know uh, you know evil guy you say oh i don't I'm not worried about him i anybody could pick that guy out you know a mile away but if he's somebody who seems suave or friendly or witty or interesting that makes him even more dangerous Irving. Yeah, yes, exactly. So, in a way, it's funny because obviously the novel, he's the most uh, famous, unreliable narrator of Presley in literature, right? So we don't really know at the end of the day what's true. Who's real, who's not real? Was Annabelle someone he knew, or did he make her up? Did he love her, or did he hurt her? You just really don't know. And well, I thought it was Annabelle Lee from the Edgar Allan Poe story. Well, I mean, that's the way I thought. Well, it all connects together. There are all these different echoes throughout. But, I mean, that's what you... Who knows? Is it Annabelle Lee from fiction? Is it an Annabelle he really met up by the sea? With Eric Hoganson. Oh, you helped fix up the book, right? Yes, I edited the script together from six different versions, all by learner, but the script is still all by learner. There were six different scripts, and each script had significant differences between each because he never really found the way to tell the story, and he was looking for that, and he only really found the device that allows you to tell the story after the production had closed in Boston. They rewrote for four more months after that, and it was then that the character of the uh, psychiatrist was added. Uh, and, you know, since it's clear that the psychiatrist disapproves of Humbert, the audience doesn't necessarily feel that they must voice their disapproval. Ooh, that's the, that's the gimmick. Ah, very cool. Okay, here we are with... George Abood. This is very different from the band's visit. It, it, it's different than everything. And it's very different than the band's visit, that's true. You're right. This is this guy lives by like the FUN policy, right? This guy's this guy's having fun. Um, I can't 
like we've had a week to work on this, right? So I think if I was able to like sink my teeth more into this and we were doing this longer, I I think I'd make him a lot even more outrageous because this guy is just wild. He's going after the fun. He's going after the hedonistic dreamlike lifestyle. You know, they're in orgies, they're doing drugs, they're having sex with each other, everybody's having a good time. Something about this this gal, but I really don't even have much interaction with her in the actual script. It's all just inference. That's true. You're like the shadowy figure. Right, and all the in the scenes and the dream states that Humbert's remembering or fantasizing about are out of order. Here we are, with Jessica Tyler Wright. And you have the unlucky task of being the mother. The mother, Charlotte Hayes. Yes, Lolita's mother. In a way, I just thought about it, but your 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 scenario is sort of Greek tragedy, isn't it? You know, it's it's very interesting. I, I've been thinking about this as a 2019 mother of a daughter. What would what would 2019 mother of a daughter in 1971? Because that's when this is actually said. What would she have done back then? And it's interesting because the the Charlotte Hayes of 1971 just needs a husband. And of course, in our telling of the story. It's all through Humbert's dialogue. It's his representation of what happened. So a lot of her crazy antics probably weren't so heightened. But yeah, she just she just wanted a husband. And I think that blinded her to maybe what she saw was happening. Really think about the life stories that they've all been through. Lolita lost her father. If she's 14 and he passed away, I forget when we did the math. When, he, when she was two, I think we did the math. She basically grew up without the father figure. And like I said, modern day times would be just fine-ish because women feel a little more empowered now. But back then, it was like, no, I need a husband. I need the male. Which is why Charlotte, in the dialogue, says, but you're the, the head of the family. You're the father. You're the man. Even though he's the stepfather, and Charlotte's been raising this child on her own for 10 years 12 Thursday Farrar and you play the psychiatrist I do I play Dr. June Ray I think because he's showing me this fantasy this idea of what he believes happened and I as we go through the story I start to realize that I'm not quite sure he's telling me the truth. And one of the first things he says to me in, in, in the beginning is about talking about fantasies. I love delving into all of that because he's had some practice being um, under psychiatric care. And as we go along, I am trying to get to the moral compass of this man, the truth. I, as a clinician, clinician um, am not his judge and jury. So all I can do is evaluate him. But in the end, I feel like the justice is to get him to at least accept the truth of what he did to this little girl. Do I, how do I turn this character, um, make that turn and say, all right, now I got you and I'm going to get you to at least accept what you did. If I can get you to do that, that's all the judgment I need. That's all the, the justice I need. Hugh, I think, is a figment, and a, 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 the fantasy of what we see of Q, of Quilty. I mean, Quilty is is a child of the '70s, absolutely. Here we are, man. Uh, Dennis Cordell. Oh God, I love the top. Oh, thank you very it's much. So yes, it's, it's Bach. Thank you. Uh, the, the, if, um, Lolita, my love, was if if not the first, it was one of the very first uh, musicals to use a Moog synthesizer in its orchestra. It was quite groundbreaking. And playing the part of the mom was Jessica Tyler Wright. Sorry, I forgot to mention that. And camera was done by Jake Goldbath. Neurology of the Soul is about neuroscience, love, the mysteries of the human soul, marketing, and art. The writer and director of this play, Edward Einhorn, subordinated the plot, structure, and dialogue to illustrate and discuss the ideas that are important to him. He executes the plot in a series of vignettes, each one of which explores one aspect of his spectrum of ideas. The plot illustrates concepts that arise when these ideas meet. There's a play here, but at times it feels like a series of lectures. The overall exploration of the ideas is worth more than the price of admission. And this is William Cataldi's review, and he's giving it a happy face minus. 
This is Jan Ewing's review of Moral Support. William Considine's Moral Support is a gentle memory play, nostalgic and autobiographical, a bittersweet tale about an estranged mother's cry for help and her son's lifelong struggle to provide it. It's well-written and acted with skill, a true cri de coeur that resonates long after the final curtain, and he gives this one a happy face. Again, all these reviews are much longer on Facebook. I just, you know, want to let you know that we saw these things. And this is where you can find the things that we saw. Uh, Hurricane Diane will be closed by the time we see it, so look for it on the Facebook page. In between Lolita, you can see Peter Felicia and Josh Ellis talking about all the shows they saw in their youth. And Jan and I are going to see this. Uh, the Gilbert and Sullivan is going to be doing 80s Go Mr. Jericho, so look for our review on the Facebook page. Jordan's going to go to Hotsy Totsy for less. This time they're doing Quantum Leap. And I'm not a comedian. I'm Lenny Bruce. It's coming back March 8th to the box. And the Frigid Festival is going on. And Mark saw the gay card at Teatro Iati and other Frigid Festivals that are, plays are going on. I hope he's the voice of authority. I'm definitely seeing Toko Toe Talks because that is about Toto's point of view. And speaking of cats and dogs, the Cat Massacre at St. Luke's. And my alma mater, Ithaca College, is going to be at 54 below, and Scott Siegel's going strong there with all of his stuff. And at MCC, at their new complex, not only can you see the light, but you can also see Alice by Heart by the same people that did Spring Awakening. Lots going on at 92nd Street. Why? Bam has some good stuff going on. Andy Burowitz. Oh, and I forgot to mention, for the British Invasion, you can go to our YouTube and see the entire press conference there and my entire interview with Peter Noon, which is so cool. Also on YouTube, you can see the entire um, opening night with Lolita and even more from everyone. These are shows we saw that closed before we could tell you about them on the show. And don't forget about Parody Productions. And don't forget to pick up your Performing Arts Insiders, Cultural Heartbeat in New York City. Next show is March 16th. And thank you to everyone. And don't forget, go to Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube.